It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, this is only my second time in Copenhagen, but it feels to me slightly ridiculous in this city to be talking about people not eating a diverse enough diet, as you alluded to, even though there are still clearly problems. Based on my very limited experience of Denmark, there's more plant diversity in a single Copenhagen hotel breakfast than many people experience in a lifetime. Um, but still, clearly, there are problems in the wider world, and most people are not making their choices in Copenhagen. And for many people, shopping in the average supermarket, pretty much anywhere in the world now, in any continent, the choices of bread, for example, I'm sorry, Luca, are not between, I mean, yeah, Pepperidge Farm, lovely in its place, but um, not between four different artisanal rye breads, but between dozens of different near identical branded loaves of sliced wheat bread, which is not technically bread at all in the sense our ancestors would have understood it. This is sad in and of itself, but what I wanted to talk about is that the even sadder thing is when people stop knowing enough to ask for any different, because they don't even crave diverse flavours anymore. So I totally agree with Renee from this morning, we should all be foragers, it would be wonderful, that world that he's trying to build, I want to be in that world. But to do that, we would also need to vastly broaden our range of preferences. So I slightly disagree with the target that was set. Target, by 2030, 50% of all people actively use knowledge of food diversity. My own target was, well, why don't we reach everyone? And wouldn't it be simpler and more ambitious to say everyone should learn to enjoy more diverse foods? So to summarize what I'm saying in a shorter form, we need to talk about diversity, not just um, about crops, about agriculture, I mean, all of the things that Miles has spoken about so well, those things are key, um, about species, about supply, about gastronomy. So I'm so happy you talked about the Cavendish bananas. So often when we talk about homogeneity, we talk about processed food, and we forget that actually even basic crops are things that are not remotely diverse in global diets. We need to talk about all those things, they're crucial, but if we want those things to happen, the diversity also needs to be enacted at the level of human desire. Diverse food requires humans with diverse preferences to eat it. And contrary to popular opinion, this is something that we have considerable power to alter. Colin Corey, a researcher into the increasing homogeneity of food crops around the world, recently wrote a line which really stuck with me. He wrote, if we are what we eat, it seems we are increasingly becoming the same kind of human being. And as Emma suggested, there can be a certain solidarity in this. There's something amazing about the fact you could go to Buenos Aires and get sushi, get pizza anywhere. It's a common language. Um, but at the same time, it becomes this self-perpetuating cycle where... Do people know to ask for something different? Gilbert Hungbo, in his excellent talk this morning, said, and I agree, a diet that lacks diversity is bland. But what if people stop finding it bland? What if people like bland? A couple of years ago, researchers looking into the causes of child obesity in the States noticed a self-reinforcing cycle. Modern children increasingly gravitated towards what nutritionists call SFS foods, foods high in sugar, fat, and salt. So in turn, manufacturers produce and market more of these foods to meet the demand, and the increased availability of these foods then stimulate the children to crave them even more. So you're stuck in this endless reinforcing cycle. So the challenge is really, to me, what if we don't want diverse foods? And my argument is that we won't build a more diverse food system until we can build human beings with more diverse preferences. So for one thing, we should talk in general at summits like this, which can become very serious, far more about pleasure. I mean, what actually drives us to sort of storm out to get another cup of coffee and look at those chocolate things and we're all excited. It's pleasure. It's pleasure and flavour that drive us to pick something up and put it in our mouths. We only get the benefits of nutrients, of diversity, through mm -hmm. desires. I don't know if anyone in this room saw, a couple of years ago, there was a Disney Pixar film called Inside Out, an animated film. Yeah, this is about a little girl and all of the emotions playing out in her head. Anger, joy, sadness. And the thing that triggers disgust in this girl is broccoli. 
And it only works as a joke because there's a kind of shared common assumption in the American audiences and the audiences around the world who saw that film, and it's a terrific film, that broccoli is obviously universally disgusting for children. But actually, that's not obvious or universal. For Japanese audiences, the Pixar animation team had to change all of the images to, of broccoli to green peppers because broccoli doesn't have the same cultural connotations. It's quite rightly seen as something delicious. And this is just one tiny example of how human tastes are not something fixed and universal. One of the most exciting things about being an omnivore is that we're capable of feeding ourselves and thriving on a vast range of different diets. There was an amazing study done by someone called Clara Davis in the 1920s where she took babies who had not had a single bite of solid food and she wanted to be, see what their tastes would be like if they were just exposed to food blind, without a parent saying, eat this, eat that, without any expectations. And left to their own devices, these children, they showed no difference between their liking for bone marrow, for liver, for raw beef, for lettuce, spinach, peaches, you name it. Any of these pure whole foods were equally appetizing, equally disgusting, equally curious, there to be explored. These babies were open-minded in a way that it's impossible for any of us to be now because we're growing up in a world that sends us all these messages about what our taste should be. Yet diversity is still at the core of what it means to be human and to eat. You can't be a koala if you don't enjoy eucalyptus leaves. But strangely enough, it's perfectly possible to be someone who doesn't enjoy cinnamon rolls or cumin seeds or insects, as the case may be, and still be human. So why, increasingly, do we talk and act as if there were these fixed human tastes? If we're serious about enacting food diversity, it has to happen at the level of individual food choice as well as of supply, and the two are deeply intertwined. We need to make pleasure a part of our conversation, and the fact we don't do so, I would suggest, reflects a deep fatalism about preference, which plays out even among nutritionists and public health officials. The idea has somehow taken root that a love of Oreo cookies is an innate aspect of human nature. But nothing is further from the truth. It's true, as Carolyn said, we're born with this hardwired love of sweetness. That's totally true. Every human baby from China to Kenya loves sweetness. Milk is a sweet substance. We're born somewhat suspicious of bitterness. We're born somewhat revolted by sourness. But there's nothing in human physiology that says that you will grow up loving chocolate fudge cakes and fearing bitter greens. And if you think about it, the two most popular beverages in the world are coffee and beer, which are both highly bitter. OK, they have a kind of payoff that you don't get from eating kale, but it shows that the possibility is there to enjoy bitterness. Miles has already said most of this more eloquently than I could, so I can skip over this quicker about the imprinting power of a mother's diet um, to form someone's later flavour preferences. But I just wanted to mention one experiment done by a couple of biologists in Philadelphia, Luca's hometown, called Julie Manella and Gary Beauchamp. They did a series of amazing experiments on the relationship of a baby to flavour and where it comes from, where do our likes and dislikes come from. And they're largely a function of what our mothers ate. I mean, OK, there's huge genetic differences. Some people are super tasters. Some people can't taste coriander properly. But aside from all of that, we fundamentally love what's familiar. And what they did is they gave pregnant women a lot of carrot juice to drink in the last trimester of pregnancy. And they found that those babies, compared to a control group, actively loved the flavour of carrots when they were first introduced to solid food. And if you imagine the power of that, I mean, it's actually, we're meant to be talking about challenges, not solutions, but yeah, the, the terrible side of that, as Mars has said, is, and it happens even at the level of the gut, aside from flavour, the terrible side of that is you have a mother who for nine months has been eating junk food, and that tastes like mother's milk to you. It tastes delicious, it tastes wonderful, it tastes like love, it tastes like celebration, it tastes like home. So it's a huge thing to overcome, but equally this power of flavour um, to imprint itself in positive ways, it could have been anything. It, it happened to be carrots. You could do that with any flavour and we would learn to love it. We eat what we like, we like what we know. And the foods that humans know are becoming eerily similar to each other in different places. 
I met a woman in Mumbai a few months ago who said, how have I, a tea drinker, become someone who craves a large Americano coffee every afternoon? Her own desires were a kind of mystery to her, and many of us are in this situation. The global average eater, as defined by researchers at SEAT, is someone whose diet consists almost exclusively, and again, Miles has done this more than I need to, of very few ingredients, refined grains, especially wheat and rice, animal products, oil, sugar. And this inevitably has a knock-on effect into preferences. The average eater is someone whose palate is skewed overwhelmingly to sweetness as well as to fat and salt. But, and this is the final part of my talk, this can change. The human olfactory system is an amazing thing. We often don't give ourselves credit for what it means to be an omnivore. Our olfactory system is totally malleable. The wonderful secret of being an omnivore is that we can change our desires even late in the game. While I was writing my last book, I came across, it was a very small scale study, but to me it was highly indicative of some Swedish researchers who decided to do something called Taste School for the Elderly. They took a group of people in their 80s, octogenarians, and they gave them cookery workshops with a view to increasing their love of life and expanding their palates. And these were people who, in seven decades on this earth, had never tasted a sweet potato or some fennel, and all it took was a friendly chef cooking it for them, talking with friends, and their taste changed. And if it's possible to do it at that age, there's hope for us all. So I just, we're not really going to talk much about solutions. I wanted to mention one thing, which is, it's a bit rich for me to be talking to you about this in Scandinavia, since you're totally ahead of the game on this, as on most things. The Sapere method of sensory education, which has been pioneered especially in Sweden and Finland. Um, I'm now part of a group bringing it to Britain under the name Flavor School. And the idea is that children learn about food through their senses. So this thing of like having the knowledge to choose a diverse diet, I agree with that, but it's actually knowledge that we hold at this tactile level in our senses. You can't know a food until you've experienced it firsthand. And I just wanted to end with one little story of a session that I did with some four and five-year-olds in a British school. I was going in and we were doing a session on touch and I took in different fruits. I took in some smooth apples, and we were feeling the smooth skin, and some spiky pineapples, and some warm, fuzzy, flat peaches. And one of the boys, we felt the peach, and then we cut it up, and we tried the slices, and he said, oh, I've never had peach. I've had peach flavor medicine, um, but this is really different. And I just felt this was a kind of parable for the way that so many of us now relate to food. We know this kind of homogenized version of taste, and if you've only had peach-flavored medicine, that's what peach should be. It tastes great. Um, and actually, the first, what I've noticed with these children, and again, it's, I'm learning nothing new here, is your first interaction with the real thing, when you've known the fake thing, it isn't always better. We assume that the real, the gastronomic, the wonderful will trump the fake. In the long run, through education and exposure, um, that could be the case. And I think the food education, the food industry has a huge role to play in potentially unsweetening our palates. I'd love to see margaritas souring agents used in products. Um, plenty of fussy toddlers blossom over time into adults who love black olives and spicy lentil dal. And the same could happen at a population level with the right interventions. But it won't happen if we forget about pleasure. Thank you.